Hello and welcome to the Happy Insights Podcast. Today's episode is going to be about meditation. I'm really excited to have a wonderful guest on the show who's going to unravel the concept and really make it simple for you to understand. I couldn't have asked for a better guest for this particular conversation. He wrote a book called Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. I have Richard Dixie, PhD, on the show today. He's a senior faculty member of Dharma College in Berkeley, California, a research scientist and a lifelong student of Buddhism who holds advanced degrees in biophysics and the history and philosophy of science. He moved to the U.S. in 2007 to devote himself to teaching meditation deepening his own practice and running the Light of Buddha Dharma Foundation in India. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for doing this because everybody talks about how important it is to meditate, yet no one does it. They're so afraid of the idea of being silent. So uh, why did you decide to write the three minutes a day? more or less precisely for the reason you just said. Um, you know, meditation's a basic life skill. It really, it's a basic life skill. Honestly, meditation should be taught along with reading and writing in fifth grade. It's like that. And the truth is that we make our world. It's all very well to, to talk about the quote, external world, the universe or whatever, but everything we experience, everything comes through one of six gates. The five senses or the gate of the mind. We have no possibility of experiencing anything outside those five or six ways of experiencing. But we, but the way we experience is not something we're taught. And if, if we don't understand it in a very deep way, we don't understand our lives. Meditation is a way of directly engaging what happens when sensations arrive at any one of those six gates. That's what it's about. And it's a basic life skill. And unfortunately, our educational system is entirely external facing and talks about inferential categories, scientific categories, cultural categories, whatever, which are all inferred from things that arrive at our sense gate. But no one talks about what happens before we infer these things, what experience actually is and that's what meditation is designed to address what is the sixth gate i got the five oh the gate of the five. mind so it's okay so there's the five senses which we already know and the sixth one is the gate of the mind so mind and emotions feelings imaginations etc so you've got sensations that come to you and you've got auditory you say you've got visual auditory etc and then you've got the gate of the mind and these are all impinging upon us. And they do so actually in sequence, not necessarily together, but nonetheless, the way they impinge and the effect they have on us is not something that we ever are taught. So as a result, people often become very reactive, like something annoys them and they're immediately reactive and they don't know why. Why is that reactivity occurring? Is there any way of controlling it? And indeed, nowadays, with modern technology, particularly phones and computer logarithms designed to capture our attention, we land up being pulled this way and that by all kinds of stuff, getting more and more irritated and more and more stressed. And again, without any capacity to control it, this is all a complete failure to understand perception. And perception is the direct object of meditation. That's what meditation is designed to understand. So it's a basic life skill. That's it. And you talked about meditation works on the before. The, the, sense of, yeah. the before. So can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Actually, you know, this book of mine I wrote, she starts off with a really amazingly interesting thing. There's a movie on the internet and it was shot in a quadrangle in a, in a, in a Southern college, I think Georgia, I think it was. And it's a, it's a security camera. And there's this guy, it's pouring with rain, and there's this guy under an umbrella, right? And he's running across the, the, the quadrangle. He's taking about two steps a second as he goes. And then there's a lightning flash. Now, lightning lands about four feet from him. And you can see the lightning on the video. It actually, you can see the spike of lightning going into the ground. This guy takes another whole step, 
half a second before he reacts. Then he doubles over and you know, oh, I've been hit by lightning and runs off. But in that half second, between the lightning flash and our reaction to it is the whole world. That's where we make the world. Now, most of us don't realize we're half a second behind events. And that's because there are very carefully designed timing mechanisms in our perception to give us the impression we're in the here and now. But we actually are not in the here and now at all. We're half a second behind it. It's about 400 milliseconds, technically, four tenths of a second. And in that four tenths of a second, all this processing goes on to make me in the world. But actually, me in the world is a processed product. It's not actuality. Actuality happened 400 milliseconds before that. Now, we do have the capacity to introspect this process. And it's that introspection, that ability to see me in the world being made that enables us to overcome in a very profound way, our reactivity and take control of our attention because our attention is grabbed, as I was mentioning. There are all of these adverts, advertisers, clever things that grab us. And as a result, we feel pulled this way and that, and everything's exhausting. And this is because we don't have control at this fundamental level of our lives. So let me clarify or just tell you what I took from what you just said. Sure. Reality is happening and we have an automated process that interprets and creates our personal reality after the real reality has occurred. Like, so the, an event happens and then in that uh, 400 milliseconds, if I'm saying it correctly, we have an automated process that decides what that moment means to us and how we're supposed to react and what we're supposed to do. And it's on autopilot. Am I correct? You are correct. But let's just a few points here. Don't talk about real reality. Remember, the only real reality any of us have is what happens to us. Everything else is an inference. We think it might be like that. And scientists tell us it could be like this, could be like that. I've got this theory. This is what we think it is now. But, you know, another two years goes by and they say, oh, no, our theory's wrong. It's like this. People get upset. But the word real is the problem. The only reality that we experience is what we experience in our own heads. Everything else is inferential. Now, we know this, actually. It's really quite common knowledge. For example, the stereo image is generated by our eyes. So we don't actually experience depth. What we do is because the images come into the, both eyes slightly differently, we construct depth. The same with our ears. We don't actually hear space and stereo. We have to have two images coming in at different phases. The same with our body image. Our body image is not what we see. It's actually made by sense receptors inside our body, which we're completely unaware of. So for example, when teenagers are growing, they outgrow their body image, which is why they're so clumsy. They knock everything over because they think their body is smaller than it actually is because they're growing. And so there are myriad examples. But of course, the fundamental one is me in the world. Now, me, who am I? What's my character? What's my background? What do I like? What do I don't like? What do I want? What do I not want? All of that stuff, that's all equally constructed. We could be anything. But the way we've been brought up has produced for us a set of ideas which we apply to our lives. And it can make us happy. It can make us sad. Indeed, Google understands you so well because it sees what you do that it can predict what you want. And therefore, it advertises to you. And so we land up being grabbed by what appears to be very personal information. But actually what it is, is it's designed to capture our pre-existing processing that's happening all the time. And it is automated in as much as it's reactive, but it's actually constructed in a very real sense too. And once you become aware of it, you can start to get control at a very fundamental level of your life. And that means that as a meditator, you get calmer, you get kinder, you get less hassled, and you get less exhausted 
by what is otherwise a relentless process of being pulled this way and that. You called it reflexive reactivity, which I take means that you're reacting without really having any control over it, which is what reactivity means. So once you get control of how you react, you basically get control of your life a lot more and your mood and your state of being and and all of that, correct? Exactly. Well, the way it normally works, people say, oh, you've got to be kinder. You've got to be nicer. You've got to, you know, so you try and apply antidotes. So you get angry and you say, no, I mustn't be angry. The trouble is if you get angry or get sad or get jealous or whatever it is, already the emotional consequences of that state of mind are in play. Your body is already being infected. Your environment's being affected. Maybe you've done something that you regret. So applying antidotes is too late. What you really should be doing is seeing the arising emotion and stopping it before it manifests. You can only do that if you meditate. Otherwise, you have no possibility because it's reflexive. And so unless you can gain insight into that reflexivity, the actions already occurred before you can control it. And this is why me me that's why meditation de-stresses our lives. That's why we find ourselves feeling calmer and more able to deal with problems. And is three minutes a day enough? Well, okay, so now we get into the next level of demystification. So meditation traditions are very ancient. They go all the way back two and a half thousand years at least. And they were normally developed for monks. And so the traditional meditation techniques normally involve sitting for hours. Now, of course, sitting for hours is great if you can do it. But from in modernity and contemporary cultures, it's really not practical. What is important and what can be achieved is a very focused approach. If you understand the physiology of what's happening in our experience, you can do very short exercises, which are very precisely designed. Some of them are absolutely traditional, by the way, but not all of them. And they're precisely designed to give experience. Once we get the idea that we can see our own experience, we can see it arising. Once you get a taste for that, then suddenly a whole world of exploration opens up. Now, of course, you know, nowadays psychedelics are very fashionable and people have all kinds of insights when they change their perceptive, perceptual field with chemical means. And as if you could only bring those insights back and embed them in your life, they would be extremely valuable. The problem is you can't. They're outside your normal experience. So normally your normal experience reasserts itself relatively quickly. And as a result, there's no permanent change. Another example is extreme sports. There's been a great fashion for bungee jumping and you know jumping off in the, those uh, skydiving outfits, having extreme experiences. Again, the reason is because extreme experiences overwhelm our ability to make sense of experience. And just for a moment, we're free. And then gradually normality reasserts itself. So there, there are plenty of examples in modernity of the wish to get free of reflexive reactivity, but you actually need a technique that you can stably develop. Now, the interesting thing about techniques is even very short periods, if done sequentially, build up. There's an old saying, water cuts through stone, not by cutting hard, but by cutting often. And the, the technique in this book is really simple. Three minutes a day, but every day for 14 weeks. And if you just three minutes a day, just every day, if you just do three minutes a day, every, it doesn't matter where or when you can do it in your workplace, you can do it at home. It doesn't mean you have to sit down in a special position. Very simple, but do it every day. And what will happen is over, the, over a period of weeks, you will build up a capacity like dripping water, just gradually builds up. And what you land with at the end of it, and this is a whole idea of the book, is a real insight into meditative development, the beginning of the completion of a life well lived. My view is without meditation, life is somewhat enigmatic. But many biographers say this. They say they get to the end of their very successful life and then they go, what was it all about? <laughs> what happened? 
And the reason is because they never, ever understood what they were constructing at the level of construction. They had success in their lives, their external activity, but their internal knowledge of what they were doing was very limited. And that means that life is always a bit enigmatic and always slightly strange. That's what meditation is designed to address. That's very well said, very beautifully put. And I know, you know, I go through phases of meditating all the time or just meditating. I, sometimes I can do it for an hour, an hour and a half, and sometimes I can't do it for two minutes. Yeah, yeah. So I really just want to speak to people that have a hard time starting up because, you know, I talk about it in my new book that's not released yet, that meditations like exercise, everyone knows they're supposed to do it, but it's, you know, something that almost you have to do it. You have to start small and then work your way up. And, and it's one of those things where, you know, you're supposed to do it. You know, the benefits, you know, how amazing it would be if you did it. But most people go through their lives saying, oh yes, I'll do it one day. And Till or, or until something happens in their lives and they're forced to do it. But I think starting with three minutes a day, which when I teach meditation, I start with one minute a day and I build up because I think you're ahead of me. <laughs> one minute is so like just getting someone to sit down for one minute is so much work. So I wanted to first talk about a couple of different types of uh, states or uh, there's shamata and vipassana. And I wanted you to give me a brief um yeah, sure. of those. So what is shamata? Okay, so all meditation has two phases. The first phase is calm down. It's called shamata. Now, the metaphor is a bit like you have a water full of dust. And if you're reacting reflexively all the time, the dust is being stirred up and the water is all turbulent. So the first technique is just to calm. Now, that's normally done by focusing on one of the six sense gates. It doesn't really matter which one, but most initial meditation techniques involve taking one of the gates and focusing on it. And what that does is calm down. Now, the second phase is called vipassana. Now, vipassana literally means see clearly. And the idea is if you leave a glass of turbulent water on a, on a table and let it, let it alone, the dust will settle, the water will clear, and you will see clearly. So Vipassana is a fruit of calming down. Without shamatha, Vipassana is not possible because you're too reactively churned up. And, you know, all meditation techniques fall into these two camps. There's been in modernity a habit of calling all meditation Vipassana. I think in many ways that's unfortunate because what it does is conflate two quite different things. Shamatha is about calming down. Vipassana is about seeing clearly. Although one leads to the other, they're not the same at all. And Vipassana involves really understanding how we make the world. You could say standing under, very interesting word understanding, standing under how we make the world. How can you do that? You can only do that if you're not reacting to how you make the world. If you're reacting to how you make the world, you're never going to stand under it. You're just going to be reacting. So you have to have shamatha. It's not, it's not negotiable. But shamatha is very easily developed. Now, the important development in developing shamatha <laughs> is to recognize that there are two elements to concentration. So shamatha always involves taking a meditation object and concentrating on it. And indeed, all of us, again, in contemporary culture, have been told to concentrate. Modern educational systems are obsessed by concentration. Concentrate, you know, this idea of always a concentrate. Now, concentration actually has two parts. The first part is to advert. It means literally to focus on. That's the first part. The second part of concentration is significantly different. It's to savor. So you turn your attention to something and then you experience it. Now, advertising is designed to capture our concentration, to take us somewhere. That's the adverting part of it. Now, that's inherently nervous, brittle. I like to call it brittle, because when something else comes along and captures our attention, we find ourselves being pulled off what we were originally on to something else. 
And most people who begin to tr attempt to meditate find that they are being pulled this way and that by things that are capturing their attention. Now, the key to overcoming this obstacle is to learn to savor. Now, once you savor something, I mean, example, you lift a cup of coffee to your lips. That's advertising. You taste the coffee. That's savoring. Now, savoring is inherently stable because what happens when you savor is if something else comes along, it just gets incorporated into your savoring. So your savoring isn't disturbed by having other things capturing your attention. So the early part of this course actually is about making that distinction experientially. Now, this is the important thing. There's no point in talking about meditation if one is not going to experience it. So what I've tried to do in this book is to give really simple exercises that are totally explained. And the idea is you don't do them if you don't understand them. But if you do do them, what will happen is you'll get an experiential, your own experience base for the difference between adverting and savoring. And once you've developed the ability to savor, then you become non-reactive because all the things that upset you just become part of your savored experience. That is the beginning of truly becoming calm. Calmness is not about putting up a brick wall around yourself, closing off all your senses and sitting in darkness. That isn't calmness. Calmness is actually about being able to engage with anything but not be disturbed, something quite different. And so again, people often feel, oh, I need to have no thoughts. The whole idea of meditation is to sit with no thoughts. It's absolute nonsense. Honestly, where this idea has come from, I have no idea. It is nonsensical. There will always be thoughts. There are always clouds in the sky, birds in the sky, and thoughts in your head. There are. The key is don't be disturbed by them. That's the key. And if you can achieve that, you achieve imperturbability. That's the proper term. And your calmness becomes a base to see clearly, which is really what we all want to do. What the hell is life about? I want to see it clearly. That's the idea, right? The reason I resonate with that is because I have nothing against meditation retreats and going because I think they do escalate or, or uh, not, sorry, they, they speed up your process sometimes. Oh. Yeah. Um, and you are able to get from point A to point B a lot faster. But a lot of times people go on retreats to decompress and then they come back to their world and it's just like they left it and they need another vacation again. Yeah. And I always tell people, so I always make sure that when I meditate, I meditate in the midst of my chaos because yeah. that's what I think is the most valuable for me unless I do want to sharpen a new skill or just, you know, I, I did a four day silent retreat in my room. I turned all the lights off. I made sure that I slept a lot and I was, you know, I was, I could, I like meditating laying down, but you have to sleep so much that you don't fall asleep. So, because otherwise if you're laying down, you pass out and you're not meditating, you're just sleeping. So I did four days of it. And after that, like certain specific abilities were so much elevated i could have i basically i i gained new psychic abilities that i never had before but then i went back into regular life and of course that sense of calm went away but when i needed that superpower it was there but it i appreciate the three day, minutes a day concept a lot more because it's more up my alley because it really does allow you to be able to snap into that state of calm when you're in craziness. Because even in my book, I have these moments where I say, uh, I teach people how to, I say, I, I call it, I call it a pause moment where I, I have them read something and I say, now pause. And then they have to count to 10 and then they have to start reading again. So I teach them that muscle that lets them go from this chaos to calm back and forth. So I have to say that. And I have to tell my viewers that this book is amazing for someone who doesn't understand meditation because you really break it down in a way that is so easy to digest because you have a scientific mind 
And you wrote it almost like a textbook, but it's not a textbook. When I was reading it, it was just so fascinating how if I had a question, it was almost like you already knew I was going to have a question and you answered it. And you did have a lot of uh, uh, questions in there that you would answer. And one of my favorite things that I saw in your book was the five obstacles, because I think that's a really important thing to cover in this episode, because a lot of people sit down to meditate and there are things and sensations that they feel that prevents them from having the experience or continuing on, or they get restless and they just want to stop. So I thought the five obstacles were things to address. If you don't mind talking about those in this episode, I think it would be very beneficial to the viewers. It's super interesting how ancient understandings of mind are still totally relevant. The, the five obstacles, the five nirvanas, are 2,500 years old, and they are still absolutely relevant today. Just like if you were to read Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor of 150 AD, he feels like a modern guy. That's because psychologically, we are not developing. We may be developing physically. We may be developing more understanding about the physical world, but psychologically, we're not developing. Now, the five Nivaranas are really interesting. These are five obstacles that come up every time we try to calm down from our normal state of reflexive reactivity, what we've talked about, this frenetic reflexivity. So as we try to calm down, five types of obstacles appear. They're in two pairs and a single one. The first pair is literally agitation and dullness. Now, what often happens is when you begin to meditate, the first thing that happens is you see all this agitation going on. You see, wow, is this really going on all the time? Yes, it is. All that's happening is you're seeing it. Now, often what happens when you try to calm from there is you go to sleep. So you immediately go to sleep because actually you're so exhausted that your agitation just goes straight into dullness. And so this pair of agitation and dullness are going to be with us until we learn to savor and we recover our energy. As you say, like if you meditate lying down, you've got to sleep a lot before you just go to sleep. But in the end, you'll be able to do it. Those are the first pair. The second pair are attraction and aversion. Now, many of our thoughts are about what we want or what we want to avoid. In fact, thinking is mainly scenario planning of one form or another. I gotta get that, I go, how do I get that? Or, oh, I gotta not do that, I'm gonna avoid, oh, wow, I wish I didn't do that. So this pair of aversion and attraction are the second pair, very big feature on of the thinking mechanism within which we are embedded. And the fifth, and probably the most important is doubt. Now, doubt is a really interesting obstacle. Now, doubt arises because the reflexive structure we have built through our childhood, our education, our parental inputs, our life experiences has created a life for us. Its primary function is to keep us alive, keep us going. So meditation is deeply disturbing to this functionality because it's basically saying, I want to have a look. Now, doubt says, don't look. No, no, you're perfectly fine. Yeah, you really don't have to do this. Don't look, don't look. Just don't, leave it alone. And it comes up in many, many different ways. Like, how can three minutes possibly work? Is a classic one. We'll come up here. Like, you can't be serious. Three minutes, nothing. And the doubts are the voice of rationality saying, don't bother. You're fine as you are. Now, we all know we're not fine as we are. But from the point of view of this reflexivity, we are because we're still alive, which is really what it's trying to do. Just keep us alive. Keep us so alive. it's fine as far as it's concerned. So that's the fifth. And these five obstacles happen to everybody all the time until they overcome them by becoming calm and have happened to everybody for at least 2,500 years. So it's kind of interesting. So how do we deal with these disruptive thoughts during meditation? I know there's the three R's you mentioned. Is yeah, that there are. Yeah, do? well, it's a bit like judo, really. Um, the problem with thoughts, thoughts aren't a problem. It's our reactivity that's the problem. Thoughts end. 
So why are they a problem? I mean, why should thoughts be so irritating? They're not. What irritates us is what they make us react to. So the thought itself is not an irritant. It's our reaction to it that's the irritant. It grabs us, adverts us. So as we gradually become less reactive, so thoughts become less problematic. Now, there are techniques to calm them down, a bit like judo. And one of the best techniques of all is to think deliberately and then stop. Now, one of the problems with thoughts is they're kind of sneaky. They sneak up in the background. You, you kind of don't see where they start. And then when they got going, they're irritating you. One of the ways to actually make thoughts less invasive is to really think deliberately for 30 seconds and then stop. Now, we normally don't think deliberately like that. It's very interesting when you do it. If you actually deliberately set out to think, think about everything, you know, think about what you're doing, count stuff, really make an effort, and then stop, you're going to find, oh, and then thought will pop up, oh, okay, fine, no problem. You've kind of exhausted the thinking for a little bit. And then when thoughts do pop up, you can see them popping up. And suddenly you realize that the thoughts themselves are not the problem. Now, there's all kinds of issues here because another element of contemporary education is blame. So we're told you've got to do well. And if you don't do well, you've got to fix it. Now, the problem with fixing it is in meditation, fixing it is reflexive. What we actually have to do is a not doing, really. It's not a fixing at all because we're trying to become calm. Remember, once the water is clear, you see clearly. You don't have to see clearly. You do see clearly. See clearly is a natural faculty of mind. The problem is the turbulence of the water. So in doing it, quote, wrong, we learn to smile, go back to what we're doing, be calm, don't worry, nothing wrong, just for three minutes. And it's overcoming that ingrained self-critical faculty that so many of us have oh i'm doing this wrong i should be doing it different I, you know what's wrong with why can't i meditate well or even worse i am meditating well that's really good all this dialogue is ultimately destructive of a very simple skill which is just being non-reactive having no commentary you're not meditating well you're not meditating badly you're just being calm. And this is the thing. It's learning this middle point between praise and blame. And once we get there, we then, allow, we then find it deepens and deepens and deepens and deepens. It's amazing. When you find the middle point, oh my gosh, down it goes. And suddenly you're calm and the commentary has stopped. So this is the problem. Many, many people have learned about meditation. Meditation was very, very fashionable. Mindfulness was a huge industry. So I'm, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have tried it. But if it's presented as a one hour practice without any proper explanation of how these obstacles arise, most people give it up. And that's really, really sad because it is a life skill that is very, very simple. But the key to it is it's a not doing. It's a not reacting. It's nothing about suppressing. It's nothing about developing. It's all about being non, not, just settling. Now, it's intensely relaxing when you find it. When you actually find that capacity, you suddenly find, wow, I have a choice. I don't have to react at all. I have a choice. I've suddenly gained an element of control in my life that was otherwise seemingly out of reach. It doesn't matter how many possessions you have, how many degrees you've got, how many achievements, how many other people think you're great. All of that doesn't matter at all. If you yourself are not in control, all you feel like is you're being dogged by everybody else. You're being pushed around. Even very successful people are profoundly disturbed. Even when they are surrounded by everyone saying, you're so great, you're so good. Often they're very unhappy because they're not in control of their own lives. They feel like they're being manipulated. This is all back to the same fundamental issue. It's our reflexive reactivity. And that's what meditation is for. And 
people talk about being the observer and really becoming aware. Is that kind of what you're talking about, just in different words? Oh, becoming... No, I'm not really. This is a, a another misconception. We're not attempting to abide in calmness as if we're in a little box and, and we're, we're not reacting because that is itself a state of tension. Really, that idea of abiding, of, of finding a calm place and living there as a watcher is actually a total misunderstanding of shamatha. Shamatha is about engaging openly with experience in a calm manner. So actually, shamatha is about engagement, calm engagement, not calm disengagement. Got it. There is a misunderstanding that meditation is about disengagement and about shutting down thought when actually what meditation is about is learning how in activity we can find calmness and for example i utterly agree with you meditate in your workplace meditate in the mess of your life that's where it matters if people have these shrines and beautiful things sit down and do their meditation then they get up actually it's when they get up it matters the shrine itself is a nice object, but what really matters is getting up. And so often you hear people who say, oh, I meditate eight hours a day. Oh, I, I, I feel a bit stressed. I meditate 12 hours. You say, come on, guys, what about living? When are you ever going to take your meditation off your cushion into your life? Because that's where it actually matters. That's where you're doing your living. And to me, finding simple techniques you can take into your life is the key to success, really. We are kind of getting closer to the end of the show. I was hoping that you would just explain one of your favorite techniques or something that some of my viewers can do that would help them during their first three minutes or something that you can suggest. Do you have something to suggest? I do. I mean, this is in the book, but look, whatever you're doing now, let's just say you're sitting at your desk. So you're sitting at your desk, sitting in the car, well, because it could get a little dangerous if you're driving, maybe. But anyway, um, let's assume you're not driving. I'm not going to advise people to do this if they're driving. But assuming you're sitting somewhere, I want you just to lay your hands on either the steering wheel, if you parked your car, or <laughs> on, a, on a desktop, and feel the sensation of the surface on your fingers. And then feel the sensation of your body in the chair or in the car seat. Then feel the sensation of your breath going in and out of your mouth. Then just allow yourself to toggle between those three feelings, your fingers, whatever they're on, your body, whatever you're sitting on, and your breath. And then just take one of them it doesn't matter which it is. It could be the fingers, it could be the body, or it could be the breath. And just watch it. Just for 10 seconds. Just allow it to be the only thing that's happening. And then stop. That's a very simple meditation technique. Nothing to it, really. But what it does is... It you feel the energy going you know, as we concentrate on a single gate. And the difficulty is that we have all of this input, all these different sensations coming at us the whole time. We have no instruction manual. We're not born with, you know, these are the buttons. Do you push this one? We're not born with this information. We just have to get on with life. So actually, we've been reactive pretty much from birth. When really we should have been sat down, had all this explained, explain how we can calm it down. And it's very, very simple. Meditation, a true meditation object, is any sensation. That means that we are surrounded by meditation objects the whole time. We don't have to sit in front of statues or light incense or that stuff at all. We just look at anything we're doing, touch anything we're sitting with. It really is as simple as that. And that is the beginning of savoring. So when we touch, 
we're adverting and then feeling that sensation is savoring technically that's vitaka which is adverting putting your concentration and then vikara which is savoring savoring is so important when you see a craftsman or a connoisseur a connoisseur they'll pick something up like an antique and you can see them touching it they're savoring it that is really the gateway to meditation our ambition is to become a craftsman of our own experience if we could be a craftsman of our perception imagine what would happen to our life suddenly life would become this incredible opportunity to make something beautiful and meaningful touching it engaging with it modifying it rather than this bombarded thing we're kind of oh my god can I, how can i get out of here that's just because we haven't learned how to engage fully with our experience that's all it is so, so I, the flowers basically the the flowers, but not just the problem with smell the flowers which is great advice is if you know what you are doing when you smell the flowers, that's enough. But just smelling the flowers without knowing why that's valuable is not enough. It's only when it's embedded with a proper understanding. But smell the flowers is a great meditation technique. Unfortunately, nowadays, none of them smell of anything. But if you can find <laughs> out about flowers that do, then by all means, smell the flowers. That's right. And yes. then you gradually see something about your life. You said that there was no instruction manual, but starting August 29th, 2023, there will be an instruction manual. Once again, it's called Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life by Richard Dixie, PhD. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. That was so good because I teach meditation. I write about meditation, yet I learned so much that I didn't know by reading your book. So even if you think you know about meditation, you got to pick up this book. It's incredible. Um, I really appreciate you existing and creating a book like this because it was designed for someone like me. I like things to be demystified and justified and explained in a way that I know what to expect. Sometimes when I know what to expect, I can detach easier or do whatever I need to do and you really did break it down so um, thank you thank you too i've enjoyed this interview and thank you so much to my audience thank you for watching thank you for listening please make sure to look in the bio you'll find all the necessary information as one to thing we should mention there's an app oh tell me oh yes yes i just ought to mention that so i we also designed an app and the idea, because it's a three minute meditation practice, I thought, why don't we get it on people's phones? So the book's got a URL and you can click on that and download a free app. And what that has is the meditation. The idea with this book, by the way, is you, you, you read chapter one, then you do the meditation on chapter one for seven days, and then you read chapter two and do that meditation for seven days. You're not meant to read it like a book. Um, and the app does exactly that. It counts your seven days then it releases the second meditation and so on through the 14 of them um and so the app is really quite helpful again to refresh your memory as to what the meditation is or well, very very simple but anyway and also to give you something you can carry around with you during your day that's great and that way you don't cheat because sometimes when people read the book and it says meditate for seven days and then i noticed in your book you said Make sure you've done it for seven days before you get to this point. And I know a lot of people will just want to finish the book and they'll just keep going. And the app will make sure that you don't do that. Well, so I mean, the problem, the problem is we don't want it to be conceptual. We want it to be experiential. So if you don't give yourself a chance to experience, then all you have is ideas. And there are lots of people who know about stuff. What you really want is someone who can actually do it. Doing it means doing it. There's no knowing about it. You need to know about it so you know what to do. Then you got to do it. There's no way out of it. I and love so that. What I hope. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I will make sure to put in all the information for everyone. And uh, please, I hope you come on the show again and, and um, when you have your next book so you can promote it. Thanks Great. again, Richard. I appreciate it. Pleasure. 
And thank you so much to my listeners and viewers. Please make sure to write a review and have a beautiful day. Thank you.